Hey guys, thanks for tuning us in for this 29th episode of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Special guests for this episode include Oklahoma State Senator Brent Howard. Melissa Rivers will be talking about her group text podcast. Susie Ragsdale will visit. She's been a lifelong backup singer, also uh, from a famous family, and has uh, new music and a video now available. We also visit with our good friend, country singer James Robert Webb, uh, just up the highway a piece up in Tulsa. He's got new music and a new single, Good Time Waiting to Happen. We'll also visit with Aaron and Rachel Bradshaw about the new series on E! Bradshaw Bunch. You can check that out Thursdays, 9 Eastern, 8 local time. And finally, we'll visit with writer and uh, comedian and activist Bruce Valanche. We'll visit with him as we wrap up the program. If you would, please take time to subscribe, drop a like, comment, leave some feedback, and please be sure and share with your friends. Up first is our good friend, Oklahoma State Senator Brent Howard. He's going to tell us how things are looking in Oklahoma City and nationwide and how those affect us here in southwest Oklahoma. First off, Brent, good to see you, my friend. Good morning, Cameron. It's Great uh, fall morning out there. It, it, is, it has been beautiful. Uh, you know, 90 degrees. So, some places 90 is bad, but uh, 90 degrees here is just, uh, that. that's a good fall day. You know, as a wheat farmer, though, I, I would sure take a rain right now. So You could take a drink, right? I could, yeah. Now, the uh, we, we continue on moving through 2020, and uh, I, I don't know if you're looking as forward to 2021 to not have to write 2020 anymore, but uh, obviously next session coming up and uh, a lot of information uh, out there, but uh, a big day tomorrow as well. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a big election next month and a big date tomorrow. Yes. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. That's Tomorrow is going to be the last day to register if you want to vote in the november 3rd election so uh in oklahoma we have a little bit more of a registration process i know some states allow you to register on the day of and get a provisional ballot but Mm -hmm. we have basically a month beforehand and so that date is tomorrow so Mm -hmm. if you want to vote um get to the county election board or you can stop by i believe the library uh, the Republican Party here in Altus, uh, a few different places Maybe have tag offices. Is that somewhere else you can sign up? Um, might depend on the tag Some agency, them, yeah. mm-hmm. um, but a lot of public buildings would have those just uh, voter registration cards, and then you can get those. But they need to be into the election office by tomorrow. That's right. Now, Brent, what uh, number wise uh, the, the the registration on voters? Do you know? Do you have any idea what percentage of re- actually registered voters we have as opposed to actual population? Well, actually, um, just was reading that this morning. Um, we're up to about 2.2 million people that are registered in the state of Oklahoma. And uh, projection on the census is we're going to have about 4 million people in the state. Wow. And, um, you know, that, that would be roughly 55%. But you have to take into account not everybody that's th- in the state is eligible to vote. You've right. got everybody that's under 18, uh, which should be somewhere around 750 to 800,000 of the population. And then you've got uh, convicted felons and, mm-hmm. and some other things. So actual registered voters in the state, um, just kind of go off the top of my head on that based on those numbers, we probably have somewhere around 75 to 80% of probably, eligible voters are actually that, registered. That, that's, that's better than I expected. Yeah. Um, now, people that actually vote is the other part of that. And uh, normally we get somewhere between 35 to 40% whenever we're talking about presidential election mm-hmm. of eligible voters actually vote. And talk about the importance of of of, get, of casting that vote as well. Well, uh, you know, it, it's your voice in the government, and uh, everybody focuses on the presidential election. I mean, that takes up all the air out of out of the room. Um, but ultimately, the more local you get, the more your your vote actually counts. And so, whenever you're talking about voting for the county commissioner for instance. Um, that's one-third of our county, so roughly one vote out of 8,000 mm-hmm. um, gets the say in that versus whenever you're talking about presidential election, you're one vote out of 330 million people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so really being able to cast your vote for those local politicians or uh, whoever's running and then being able to converse with them. So we are democracy-based, mm-hmm. uh, which means that uh, you know, talk to your representative, cast your vote, have your say. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, we're, as we talk going uh, into next session, a lot of things on uh, on the top priority list and and money and numbers. I know <laughs> uh, money is one of the big stressors in life, and I know uh, it's got to uh, be that way in the legislature as well, right? No different for the state. We are a balanced budget state, which requires that everything that we spend, we have to have the actual physical money mm-hmm. either coming in for that year or on hand to be able to spend. Uh, talked a little bit last year. We had about a $7.8 billion budget that we appropriated. Um, of that, we had to pull about $700 million out of rainy day fund, revenue stabilization, or other time, one-time fund spending. Um, as we're going into this next year, the projected revenue for last year was $7.1 billion. I think we're probably going to be pretty flat on that. So actual income is going to be seven point one. We might see an increase because the fiscal year for the state actually starts on July 1st. And I do think that we're going to have probably vaccine. We're going to have a lot more things open up by then. And uh, hopefully we'll see a little bit more increase in oil prices. So that projection might move up a little. Um but ultimately, that's kind of the numbers that we're looking at. So if we're our one-time fund availability now, whereas we came into 2020 with about a $1.1 billion um, set aside rainy day revenue stabilization, we're sitting at about $235 million right now. Um, so, again, we spent $700 million of one-time funds. We've only got 235 available we're going to be looking at cuts unless there's uh, really a big increase in where those revenues come from. Uh, and then the other thing is we're going to have increased spending that's going to have to come in place. Uh, so budget's not really looking good. The biggest portion of that increased spending is going to be on the Medicaid expansion. Uh, with layoffs, with everything that's kind of gone on, Medicaid expansion populations probably going to be significantly larger than what all the proposals were. Um, you know, initial scoring and some of the people that were pushing the the vote on that was around 130 million as an annual cost. Mm-hmm. The projections that I'm looking at and have heard about are going to be at least 180 million mm-hmm. and possibly as high as about 310 million. Wow. So whenever we're talking about that money's going to have to be spent every year because that's in the constitution. So we're really starting behind the eight ball on this um, and. Ultimately, I think we're looking at somewhere around a 1.1 or 1.1 1 billion to a 1.1 billion shortfall before anything really comes in. 1.1. That and that's not just pocket change. That's not. That's a lot um, of. Ze- How many zeros is that? Is that 12 zeros? No, nine, not quite. Wouldn't quite nine? be. Let's see. Six, It'd be nine, yeah, nine, one right? followed by nine zeros. Okay. All right. That's a, that's a lot of zeros. That is that's a lot of zeros. Now, uh, <laughs> along with the budget lines, you talked about uh, some increases, but you're also going to have to make some cuts. Uh, where where do those cuts come? Where where are the the words that the constituents? What are they? What are where are they saying those cuts should come from? Uh, really, haven't heard from many constituents okay. yet. Uh, these numbers were just preliminary coming in. Okay. Uh, talked with budget chair yesterday, and so that's kind of what. Uh, it's not really a surprise, but really didn't have those numbers. Mm-hmm. And the other thing I forgot to mention was uh, Oklahoma Tax Commission. With the Supreme Court's McGirt decision, mm-hmm. Oklahoma Tax Commission just released a report earlier this month that said that that you know, sovereign nation that they determined for um, the Creek mm-hmm. tribe, Creek, Creek Nation, uh, could ultimately affect up to about $200 million a year in income tax and sales tax that comes into the state. Um so if that gets applied to all five of the tribes that are eastern Oklahoma, you know, that's less revenue that we're going to mm-hmm. have coming in. Um, what we're looking at right now, so we cut about $400 million out of spending last year, mm-hmm. and that was around a 4 to 5% cut across the board for all agencies. Um, that's probably what we'll look at. Um, whenever, uh, you know, just being honest, there's a lot of agencies and a lot of departments that get bigger portions of where spending comes in. And so even if we do across the board, education, whenever we're talking about K through 12, public education, common education, receives about 38% of our state appropriated budget. Mm -hmm. And so a 4% cut to 38% is obviously going to be a lot more than whenever you're talking about 
um, mental health services, Mm -hmm. which might only receive about, uh, I think they receive six to seven percent, so a four percent cut there. Still going to be the same percentage, right? uh, But but just less effect on the number, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, as we move forward, also the, uh, the, the I was looking at the Midwest Consumer Index. I mean, those come out each week, and the, it seems like the Consumer Index and also the uh, the, the the Confidence Index continue going up. Uh, unemployment uh, still going down. Where are we at? Uh, are people still uh, seeing confidence in the in the future is what I guess I'm asking. I think so. Um, if you Keep your head out of the news and don't just get buried in what's going on and all the fighting going on at the national level. I think ultimately people are are getting more comfortable with where we're at um, and then also have a lot more availability. Mm -hmm. So as you're looking at, you know, all around here, we're pretty much open, Um, have some friends still in D.C., and things are just now starting to open back up. Mm -hmm. You know, restaurants um, were completely closed down, so... Look out your back window, and I think that you can feel a lot better about what's going on. Um, ultimately, yeah, our impl- unemployment rate continues to fall, which is a good thing. I think people need a purpose. Mm-hmm. And so going out, and that's probably more beneficial for mental health and outlook, really, than than just the money aspect of it. That's right. That's right. And uh, I know we've talked about this before, and uh, Quartz Mountain uh, got some exciting news about that as well. Yes, so uh, Representative Ortega and I were able to sponsor bills that moved Course Mountain back over to tourism. Mm-hmm. It had been under the Regents for Higher Education, um, which you know had good aspects of it. It allowed us to have a local board because it was set up kind of as an educational institution. The bad part of that is that the Regents are a constitutional authority, so they have uh, we have no say in what their budgeting is. And over the past twenty years, their actual per dollar expenditure uh, has gone down by about $1.1 million on average for what they get appropriated. Again, legislature had no say in that because Mm -hmm. we can only allocate or we can only appropriate to the state regions for higher education and then allocation was 100% up to theirs. So as of October 1st, the bill went into effect and Quartz Mountain is under tourism. So we were able to spend a little bit of money on there. We've got about $3 million that's going to go into capital improvement projects as well as we increase their appropriation by about 350000 nice. from what they received from last year. So you should see some um, changes going on. Uh, there's going to be a new executive director, the one that had been over at Steed, Great Plains State mm-hmm. Park, has moved into Course Mountain. And so he's got, um, you know, if you've been over there, just everything kept up well. Of course, he's had the support on it too, mm-hmm. so... Uh, that's nothing against our previous executive directors. They just haven't had the funding. Right. But now that we've got that in place, I think you're going to see a lot of increases in maintenance, um, actual upkeep, mm-hmm. and then we're actually going to start doing a lot of renovations on the actual Quartz Mountain Lodge, which is going to be, again, a gym and hopefully bring in a lot more conferences and a lot more revenue and, and tourism right. to this part of the state. Um, with that... Quartz Mountain right now is not under a pay-to-park, but I do anticipate that it will go into that. Uh, State parks now can charge Mm -hmm. $7, or you can buy an annual pass uh, that will cover every park for $60. Um, But the provision of that is that once you – that park that collects that money is the only one where that revenue gets spent. Okay. So if you go up and uh, I believe the lodge will be exempt because you'd be paying for the room and, mm-hmm. and or just going into the restaurant. But if you want to use the actual state park facilities, then that's where that seven dollars and then um, just the parks that have actually been receiving this since June 1st or mm-hmm. July 1st um, have just had phenomenal success in where they've been able to reinvest that and make improvements within the park. So I'm really thinking that we're going to see. Uh, quite a bit come from come through Quartz Mountain in the near future. Well, that's good news. And uh, <laughs> again, Brent, if folks have uh, have questions, would like more information, uh, email still the best. Yeah, um, have been going up to the Capitol to be able to answer phones, but that's still just about one day a week, mm-hmm. so you won't catch me much up there. But if you do call in four zero five five two one five six one two, messages can be given to me. 
Again, that's just kind of transcribed or summary. Mm -hmm. So if you want a full story or full details, email me at brent.howard at oksenate.gov, and um, I'll be able to respond to those directly. All right. Well, Brent, always good to visit with you and uh, keeping us updated. Uh, Sometimes good news. Sometimes uh, it's just the news we need to hear. Sometimes it's just news. (laughs) That's right. Well, Brent, have a a great rest of your month, and uh, we'll talk to you in November. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Thank you, Cameron. Had the opportunity to visit earlier this morning with Melissa Rivers. We talked about her new group text podcast. Always good to have our friends back on the air. Going to talk about a new podcast, or actually a podcast that's been up and running for a while. Group text with Melissa Rivers, and uh, who else to have than Melissa on the line this morning? And Melissa, always great to visit with you. Nice to hear your voice. <laughs> and, and Melissa, this uh, I was telling you, you've delved into the podcasting thing, and what what has this podcast meant to you personally? Um, I love doing it. I so enjoy it, and. Every week is anchored by whatever day we're taping. And it has helped keep me sane through all of this because at least I have some sort of a creative outlet. <laughs> and, and having the friends that you have to be, to be able to come in and show their support as well to be a, a part of that podcast, what's that, what's that mean uh, as far as those relationships that you've got as well? Um, it's amazing. And um, you know, I feel like I've made some new friends out of it. And uh, it, it's super special. And I know there's uh, you guys talk on all kinds of uh, of different subjects. I know that uh, love quarantine style was was one of the episodes that kind of stuck out to me. And uh, where do you where do you reach for those topics? Um, you know, we have a great group of friends, and we we talk about everything. And I, I literally ask, "What do you want to talk about?" And who is uh, who has who's the one that got you into the podcasting in the first place? And were you originally excited about it or a little bit hesitant originally? Um, I was super hesitant, um, but I have great friends that, you know, convinced me that it was a really good idea and a really good outlet for me. And what are, what are maybe some of the upcoming episodes that folks can look forward to as well? Um, I'm just finishing up my sort of mini series on comedy uh, where I talk to people like Jeff Ross and Bob Saget and Margaret Cho and Dion Cole about are we going to be able to laugh again? And then I also do something, you know, I also just did one with a dermatologist about what should we be doing at home so we don't look like, you know, a night like, you know, Friday the 13th and need a when we come out of quarantine. And and along with that, I mean, do, do you is there a line where you where you draw the line we're not going to go there or or is it just kind of a wide open uh, variety of topics? It's a wide open variety of topics. You know, we try and make it fun and interesting and informative, and we try and stay out of the political lane. That's that's that, that that's one of the tricks in in podcasting. Is it they have the politics on them? I'm. It's an instant Passover because it's heavy enough out there anyway, isn't it, Melissa? Oh my God, I'm so <laughs> tired of turning on the TV and having you know people screaming. And, and, and it's both sides. Nobody, neither side likes each other just as much as the other. So uh, well, we just ought to move along, let them vote, and uh, and whatever happens, happens. But uh, I know you guys touch some sensitive subjects as well. And d- does that make it a little uncomfortable, or, uh, or are you excited to share those as well? Um, I think you have to do the uncomfortable as well as the comfortable. You know, I think that's how you get interesting conversation. And... W- who has had the, uh, the the biggest influence on uh, on your delivery style? I know your, your mom had to have a huge uh, impact on your life. And do you still hear her voice uh, leading you along as as you're doing the show as well? Um, I mean, that's a good question. You know, I hear her voice in my head all the time to the point where I want to turn around and be like, shut up already. <laughs> yeah, you can't turn her off anymore, can you? <laughs> no, I can't. I can't. There's no channel to change. That is awesome. Now, uh, Melissa, where can folks, uh, I want to make sure they can not only follow the podcast, but social media, every, uh, everywhere they can find more information about what you got going on. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, sorry, someone was just asking me a question. Um, it, it's someone who works for me's birthday, and I'm trying to get her out of the room so I can <laughs> get her gift out of the closet um, as we're talking. Um, yeah, you can find me on every single, you know, uh, uh, platform 
And that is, uh, again, the uh, group text with Melissa Rivers. And, Melissa, it's always great to visit with you. I'm looking forward to uh, finishing the show so I can check out uh, some of the, some more of the episodes. And hopefully we can catch up again real soon. Thank you. And hopefully I'll figure out where I hid that damn birthday gift. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, have a great rest of your week. <laughs> Thank you. And our next guest, uh, Susie Ragsdale on the line, and uh, this is actually going to be my first introduction to Susie, so uh, we we will both uh, get, we will all get to know Susie a little bit better today, and uh, artist, musician as well, Susie Ragsdale, nice to visit with you today, and uh, thank you for your time. Well, thank you for having me on, I really appreciate getting to be heard by people that are not just right in my vicinity, I've been doing little local things, but great to be on the radio out in Oklahoma. <laughs> and, and Susie, uh, I, I guess the the obvious question right off the bat is uh, is where did uh, where did where did music first start for you? Oh well, I, I was born to a, a musical father who's a singer songwriter comedian. His name is Ray Stevens, and uh, he by the time I was born, he had started having some success. And then I uh, I and my older sister and her second grade class while I was in kindergarten, uh, we sang uh, Jesus Loves the Little Children on the front end of Everything is Beautiful in 1970, which went on to win a Grammy for him. And I kind of loved being in the studio and hearing myself <laughs> back on a record. So it was a, it was a done deal by that point. Now, now, did you did you go through those teen years as a, as a rebellious teen, or even uh, uh, into the twenties that you were like, you know, Dad did his music thing. I, I'm going to try something different. Was that? Well, did you have those times as well? You know, I think it, I, I wasn't really rebelling. I was just liking different things other than you know. Like I listened to and memorized every record my dad made up until I was a teenager. And then I got into Elvis Costello and Van Morrison and, oh gosh, Hart, (laughs) you know, the sisters, all sorts of Graham Parker, all sorts of cool stuff um, that, you know, maybe my father wouldn't necessarily be identifying with, but he always, he always uh, gave everything a chance as far as how good is the writing and how good is the production and the singing. So it wasn't really like any kind of argument thing. Um, I just spent a few years not really paying attention to what my father was putting out, and I guess that's the that's the sort of the growing up, getting away from the nest kind of thing that everybody does. And uh, you you dropped the video for for live until you die, and uh, tell our listeners a little bit about uh, about live until you die, and also the the, the new album uh, Ghost Town that's uh, that's arriving this month as well. Okay, yeah. Well, the video I had written that song. A, a year or two ago, uh, well, more than two now, because I had still lived in the city when I wrote it. And when I was making this EP, Ghost Town, with the producer that Sam Frank, who came over from London to to put it together with me, we chose the six best songs of all, like maybe twenty four I had sent him, to make it all sort of hang together. And we thought that one was was a good comic relief sort of thing. I mean. Talking about dying doesn't sound funny, but but it's a kind of a funny song as far as I'm concerned. And then while he was at my house recording for a month, it was from Valentine's until March 16th. During that time, the pandemic hit, and the lyrics to Live Until You Die sort of took on a new meaning for everybody that heard it. Like, oh, wow, perfect pandemic song, you know, because what can you do? You're in quarantine. Eat, drink, sleep, wash, rinse, repeat, and wait for something to change, you know. And and for you, oh. it did, did did the meaning for you change as well as a result of uh, of what everybody's going through right now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I saw how it was more topical than when I was just bitching and moaning about how life is hard, but it's better than dying. <laughs> it, it was more like people can empathize better when everybody's having a hard time, not just me. <laughs> And where where do you get the, the the basis for your songwriting? I mean, is is it the everyday life, or and, and who is who has inspired the, uh, the 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 creative process in your brain as well? Mm, well, I think probably my father first. You know, he's a good writer, he's a good producer, he's a good arranger, singer, better better piano player than I will ever be. 
and you know I grew, grew up with with that in in my house. So there was him, and then I think Carol King had a big influence on my writing. Um, I, I never would think that I'm that good, but she sure did make me want to be that good. And uh, all the other writers like Elvis Costello, what a way with words and. Sometimes, you know, so many words, you don't even know what he's talking about. But usually it's, it's entertaining regardless, you know. And, um, you yeah, know, that, that was a lot of my writing. Uh, oh, gosh, the Beatles, the Eagles, uh, a lot of writers. And then all the reading I did, not only of just um, fiction, but of poetry, uh, the Southern agrar- agra- Agrarian, yes, is that how you say it? Poet, like like Flannery O'Connor and Eudora Welty and all those people I learned of in high school uh, and really enjoyed poetry and literature better than every other course in school except for philosophy. That was a real fun one, too. Now like you- intro to philosophy. You talked about being in the city and now now out uh, out and alone out in, in nature. Does does that help the creative process for you, or do, or do you find yourself dealing with writer's block more because of not seeing as many things, if you will? <laughs> well, no, you know, I think it's a lot of really good space to think and meditate and reflect, and I still get to get to town every now and then like I'm here now to talk with you I'm, I've got some friends that put on our masks and, and get socially distantly apart but talk to each other and hang out um, I even do like a lot of Zoom yoga classes where it's in real time and you're actually talking with your friends and exercising with your friends so I think the country has been it's a real creative kind of space out there um, everyone that visits me it's, of course, it's a great place to visit, first of all, because there's so much room with six and a half acres. You, you don't need to get close to anybody to come say hello. <laughs> so, But everybody that comes out there just is, wants to hang out and be creative and you know, listen to music or play music. It's just a beautiful little paradise out there. And, and Susie, if folks want to find out more information uh, about the video, also about uh, the album that's coming out on the 9th, uh, where, where would folks find more information about that? Well, there's, um, I've got SusieRagsdale.com, and you spell my name S-U-Z-I-R-A-G-S-D-A-L-E.com. And I've been posting things on there since we started um, putting the record together. I've got actually three videos from this EP. There's Wildflowers. There's Live Until You Die. And then just yesterday, we premiered one for a song called The Ending, which is uh, maybe my favorite song on the record. I don't know. Like, it kind of goes, it kind of floats around. But, um, but yeah, SusieRagsdale.com. And then there's a YouTube channel where you can watch not only those videos, but videos from the past, cooking videos. Uh, I don't think I have any yoga videos up, but I've got yoga poses and recipes on my website and all sorts of kind of lifestyle cooking yoga and music maybe in reverse order <laughs> and, and you, something stuck out to me you talked about you know the the song your favorite being uh changing uh from from day to day Did, is that the, kind of the way like doing the the the, the vocal is vocalizations that you've done before the backing vocals were, were some of the, the more popular ones maybe not as close to your heart as well oh well I've been lucky to have been hired to sing with some great singers and getting to do backgrounds with Guy Clark, Daryl Scott, Berlin Thompson, and then the more famous ones, mainstreamy ones like Susie Boggess and Pam Tillis and Hank Jr. and Loretta Lynn even. I mean, it's so much fun. Usually those are on songs that I didn't write. So, you know, it's great that, that I get to work with such talented, wonderful artists to where I, I love the songs and I enjoy singing background as much as I do singing the lead. Um, but, you know, I really, they're all kind of close to my heart while I'm performing them. Um, I'm just glad I'm out of that phase in my 20s, teens, 20s. Uh, when I used to, I used to sing just anything, anybody give me 50 bucks or 100 bucks to come sing their demos, you know, and they were just, you know, it was for the money back then. I was trying to pay the bills. 
And they weren't all great songs. I won't remember who wrote them, but some of them would just like get stuck in your head because you gotta you gotta learn it well enough to do a good job, and then you've got this piece of crap stuck in your head for the next few days. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I need that fifty bucks anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Take it back, please. Remove this from my mind. Exactly. <laughs> that's awesome well well Susie, i uh I, I really appreciate the time today it's it's been great to get to get to know you a little better uh, again visit uh, the website check her out on social media as well and Susie, hopefully we can catch up again real soon yeah. well i really want to thank you so much for talking with me and helping me get it out there for people to hear i just really it's you know there's been a long career of few and far between that i'm on the radio so i'm really appreciative of it All right, guys, our next guest on the podcast today is a uh, country star and uh, also friend, uh, James Robert Webb. And uh, first off, James, always great to visit with you, my friend. Hey, Cameron, it's good to be talking to you again. We're both Okies, so we got that going. For yeah, us. and and this uh, this year, we uh, I think this is like the first year in a while that we haven't had the opportunity. We're on opposite ends of the state, so we actually haven't been able to travel in between much. That's right. Uh, you know, t- Oklahoma is not as big as Texas. If you know people aren't from from this area, but it is uh, what is it, about eight hours between us, Tulsa and uh, and Altus. It's uh, six hours. It, it five or six, I think. Five or six. See, I'm, uh, all right, I got you. It seems <laughs> like uh, maybe it seems like eight because I'm can't wait to get there. That's I'm right. Patient when I That's drive. Right. But. Now, James, through the through the, uh, the 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 whole pandemic, all that's going on, obviously, it's had an effect not only on you uh, professionally, but also uh, personally in in your regular line of work. And uh, putting a, a new single out uh, just recently, how how has this differed from the singles that have been released in the past? Oh wow, yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting. I mean, we. <laughs> The album just came out, a James Robert Webb album just came out May 1st. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it has been interesting doing this in COVID. We had delayed it because of COVID and we decided, well, we just need to go ahead and get it out because we'd already had a couple of singles uh, that had done well. And so this whole COVID situation has been really interesting because we have, you know, lots of new music, but we're not getting able, not able to get out and play in front of people. Uh, And, I've been kind of lucky, I think, on the last two singles have kind of almost uh, taken it on a different meaning in the pandemic. Because uh, Think About It was really a song about, uh, it was my first top 40 as a writer and artist on Billboard Country. And uh, it's really a song that we wrote kind of just about reconnecting with the natural world and, you know, like putting down the electronics, which is so freaky, you know, <laughs> that we released it kind of in, in a pandemic time because uh, everybody's, you know, that's about some of the only COVID approved activities are That's right. going out and being in nature and the, and the new single good time waiting to happen. I, I really feel like everybody, uh, you know, artists, entertainers, fans, everybody's just waiting for us to be able to go out and have a good time again. You wait for those concerts that have been pushed off. So it's kind of like good time waiting to happen. Also uh, is, has a different meaning through the lens of COVID in 2020. And uh, you, you talk about uh, getting when things open back up. How how much uh, how hard is it doing doing a Facebook? Call? I don't. I've never had to do that. But what's it like playing to an audience that may or may not respond via via message while you're playing? That's right. I mean, it's difficult, but it, I think it makes you a better performer because uh, it's a lot easier in a either you know in a sold out room or even a a small room with just a few people to have that interaction and there's, you know, something you can see the looks in people's eyes and you can see them singing along or you can see them tearing up and uh, not getting that feedback on lives is, is a little bit different, but it's also good because some of my, you know, my Webbers can kind of watch me anyway, right? They don't have to, it doesn't, I don't have to be in their town for them to, to see me. So that part I've enjoyed the most. And, and how have you been reactive through this whole COVID-19 situation? I'm, I'm just going to say for myself, I, at first I kind of laughed it off, but then I went in, in full lockdown mode and, uh, and was completely uh, protective about everything, uh, maybe a little bit overboard. Uh, but I think I've, I've slacked a little bit now. But uh, what about yourself? How, is, how has it been for you? Well, 
I, um, early on, I think it's always prudent to use caution because we don't know what's going on, you know, really with, with something that's new. And there's always the potential. We haven't had one yet, but you never know when we're going to have some kind of engineered virus that has other effects or, you know what I mean, that we can't explain. So uh, I definitely, we were in, we pretty much went in lockdown for the most part uh, because I, my mother was uh, really ill and then uh, my daughters both have heart conditions and things. So uh, mainly for that and then plus the patients I work with uh, are tend to be older patients that are higher risk. So I pretty much stayed in lockdown because of that um, just for them. But as it's gone on, we've seen, you know, the death rates are not very high. I mean, we have a lot of people that have died, which is too many, you know, over 200,000. But, uh, you know, that's, you know, we see that that's not even, we're not even close to the number of people that die every year from heart attacks, for example. You know, but it's a, it's a national emergency. I think our response was, uh, was kind of crazy. You know, it's a big experiment to quarantine all the healthy people. And there's been a lot of lot of doctors and scientists that have you know, come out against that, and they're just being ignored by the media, unfortunately. So I don't, you know, I'm not too concerned. I mean, it, you never know. You might be in that 1.3 percent or whatever that die that get it. But uh, I really, my recommendation to everybody is to, you know, always practice good hygiene and try to stay away from you know, people that are coughing, and and uh, especially if you're higher risk, yeah, isolate. I mean, you should probably do that a lot of times anyway. And James, has this has this year uh, bred into you some some inspiration? Has it has it inspired you in your writing? Yes, I mean, uh, I think this year in 2020 has been a crazy year, right? And I have written, I've written both more and with a greater number of other artists and writers this year, in a larger variety, you know, in different genres. And so you can't help but for the, the times to kind of feed into the songs. Um, but yeah, there's definitely been some interesting creative leaps. And, and I've also taken this time really just to disappear a little bit um, and kind of hone my craft more. Um, so for me, that's kind of you know reflecting on where I've been in, in this album and kind of where I want to go on the next project and, and things like that. And you usually don't have time to kind of sit and think about that. <laughs> Yeah. You, you gotta, you gotta count those blessings, right? That's right. I mean, so out of this, out of 2020 and kind of sitting back and seeing how things are going, it's, uh, you know, I've had a tremendous response with like, uh, the Western swing version of Tulsa time that we did on the album, um, that was picked up and, and supported on Willie's Roadhouse on Sirius XM. Um, it's, I think our top three, our th- third highest catalog, I think on a song on Apple music. And I've started noticing a lot of Western swing outlets, like uh, there's a local NPR station has a swing uh, state, uh, swing program that started playing in a couple other outlets across the country, which is kind of cool. So I had, in the back of my mind, wanted to do a Western swing just like, uh, you know, like an EP. Uh, so, but that's kind of solidified the idea that I, I think there's definitely a taste for that kind of music, too. Not that that's, I want to do that exclusively, but we're definitely going to have something like that coming out. Uh, in 2021 and uh, even though we're still you know we haven't got to tour this current album we're already you know planning on working on new music with buddy cannon so that's cool. lots of and, things going on. and how special was that for you on, on a personal level to to have the opportunity to record tulsa time in the first place yeah uh recording tulsa time with buddy and, and the band uh has been i think we recorded actually at the end of 2018 and Buddy and I both have a love of Western swing. We kind of talked about that. You know, we both grew up, he grew up listening to some albums I think his uncle had. And I grew up in Tulsa and heard it like on KDOO. And, uh, you know, Tulsa is the home of the Canes Ballroom where Bob Wills was forever. And uh, so it's just kind of in the, in the blood in Tulsa. Uh, so to be able to, we wanted to do a Western swing song. We wanted to do a cover and we didn't really want to do a, a, uh, you know, one that had been done a million times. And so uh, Buddy came up with the idea one one morning we came to the session and he handed me the lyric sheet and said, what do you think about this? He had a gleam in his eye. And uh, I thought, yes, definitely. I'd never, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. I love taking songs that are well-known and kind of well-worn and maybe a little tired uh, in spinning them 180 degrees and with a different production, you know, making them new again. 
That's that was good. so much fun to do that, and, and plus to be kind of a tribute to my hometown and, and the great you know Bob Wills tradition. And uh, as as we get uh, toward the end of the the of the year, what is what is uh, Thanksgiving? Uh, what what does Christmas look like for you this year? I don't know. I mean, that's that's kind of the big question. Uh, we're kind of part of us. Uh, I think a lot of us are just waiting until after the election to see what happens. And uh, you know, I, I think there's a good chance that after the election happens, that uh, all this COVID craziness is going to go away a little bit. Uh, regardless of who, you know, probably regardless of who wins. But uh, I think it's so been so politicized uh, with all the virtue signaling and everything. It's just so, so tired of, of hearing that. So, but if it's, you know, if we're having, you know, a lot more, uh, a lot more increase in cases and, and things like that, then, you know, everybody's going to want to be doing the responsible thing. I've heard like a third of people are planning on doing a virtual, like a Zoom Thanksgiving or something. Is that what I heard? That I know a lot yeah. of people are, yeah. I mean, my, I have three, I have three kids at home and, you know, so we, even to ourselves, just the five of us uh, have had a pretty good time on holidays, but uh, if we can, you know, it will definitely, uh, we would probably miss seeing grandma and grandpa. So, I, and I don't think that uh, the grandparents are going to let that happen. So I, I suspect that Christmas will be with the family uh, as usual, although we're probably not going to be out uh, caroling and, and uh, things like that. There you go. Now, now, James, I always want to make sure and uh, and let our listeners know uh, where they can find out about uh, more information about the music. Uh, also, follow you social media wise, and uh, and as uh, the tour dates uh, become available, let them know about that as well. Absolutely. Uh, the best way to find me is you can just Google or whichever search engine James Robert Webb, and it's two B's W E B B. Uh, JamesRobertWebb dot com will have my tour dates, and that's got the store on it. You can you know get merch and t-shirts and physical copies of the cd but if you want to just check out the music uh try to make it easy it's all james robert webb whether it's spotify deezer uh, youtube uh, apple music and uh, all the social channels are the same youtube is james robert webb facebook instagram twitter all of those so yeah go and check it out if you go to the website jamesrobertweb.com there's a link where you can go listen to the album or it'll take you to your favorite store well, awesome. Well, James, it is always great to visit with you, my friend. I I appreciate the time, and, and I love the ambiance. I love the birds in the background. That's good stuff. Well, I was going to ask if you heard the hawks. I had about uh, <laughs> I had two two red tail hawks fly by, and then I saw a peregrine falcon swoop. So I wasn't uh, sure if you heard that, but that is, yeah, that's a nice thing a thing of beauty to be out in nature right now. Uh, the world's going on. The world keeps moving despite 2020. <laughs> That's Thanks right. Thanks for having me on, Cameron. Well, James, it's uh, it's been a privilege and uh, always good to visit with you. Hopefully we'll catch up again real soon. Absolutely. Thanks. Our next guests are Aaron and Rachel Bradshaw. They are talking about Bradshaw Bunch. Check it out Thursday evenings on E. The Bradshaw Bunch, Thursday nights, 9 Eastern, 8 local time on E. And uh, this morning, we've got Aaron and Rachel from the Bradshaw Bunch on the line with us. And first off, guys, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Now, now when, the, when the Bradshaw Bunch first was uh, idealized and brought to you, uh, what was your initial reaction, your initial thought? Erin, I'm going to ask you first, and then Rachel, uh, your thoughts as well. You know, at first when they approached us about it, you know, it's, it's definitely an, a, a unique opportunity, you know, to have a, a production company want to film your life and, you know, think you're interesting and exciting enough to want to come into your into your world and share it with everybody and you know at first it was a little scary you know because you're opening up your your whole personal life to the world um but it's been super fun and exciting you know definitely something new for me that i've never done before so you know it's it's been fun to do it it's been a really cool journey um hopefully we get to continue to do it for more seasons to come but um you know overall it was a great experience and we had a blast doing it and Hopefully we can, you know, continue it. And Rachel, for you. Yeah, whenever we, we filmed the pilot and everyone was kind of like, oh, we can get a show. Well, that was just a fun thing we did. Then we get the show. And I, I was like, oh, whoa, we better buckle up. This is, this is a really big network. And I didn't really know how everyone else was going to take it because we haven't done anything like this before. This is a whole new can of worms. So, um, 
And then the cameras rolled, and everybody was so funny and so just not scared of the cameras, which is why the show, I think people love it because it, it looks great. Everybody's just having fun. Now, how true to life is that? And, and, and how many of the times that you were kind of uh, cringing about, were you glad that uh, got cut out in editing, if you will? Aaron? <laughs> Wait, I, I, what parts got cut out? <laughs> Maybe the parts that got cut out that you were uh, happy to see were not there. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can definitely say I had a few moments where when we were done filming, I'm like, you know, maybe trimming that down to about five <laughs> seconds <laughs> but, um, you know we're i will say we're a very fun loud obviously vibrant open family we're very honest um so you know that's kind of something that comes with the territory with us with filming but i can definitely say we did have a few moments where you might have slipped and said something or made a comment and <laughs> there's a few episodes i watched that i thought I'm not real sure, you know, what they're going to choose to put on this episode. And um, so, yeah, definitely some moments there. But overall, I mean, it, it's been really, really fun. And guys, I, I guess, Rachel, I'll ask you, are, were you ever worried whenever the idea was approached? Because d- Terry being the, 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 the huge name and uh, the popular figure that he is, uh, about tarnishing that with a reality, was that ever a concern? Um, were, are you asking um, about how this show came about? Well, I just asking if with reality shows, you know, one one off word can 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 ruin a reality star. And with Terry having the following that he has, I just wonder if that was ever a concern. Yeah, you know, um, Dad, man, he has a mouth on him, so there have, there are a few things, and I'm like, why would you say that? And then the, uh, our producer Jason Derlick, who we love, we trust him, he would just shake. He said, "He's like, oh dear God." I mean, like, so I know that they have our backs and so they're not going to put anything in the show that would maybe rub someone the wrong way but you know that i think that's a common fear when you're doing reality you do not find the day what are they going to edit what what do i look like do i i mean that one word could that be twisted and so it's a genuine concern and as and as new episodes are are upcoming uh aaron want to ask you what the what the what the listeners can can look forward to in the coming episodes well you can definitely look forward to my dad eating a worm. That's that's <laughs> that's definitely coming up on tonight's episode. Um, we have a lot of more fun things coming up. We've got um, we share a little insight into my dad's house being haunted, which I will tell everyone listening that his house is haunted. Um, so it's not fabricated. It's you know it's it's very real. Um, it's been going on for years now. It's kind of become a joke with us. Um, and, you know, aside from laughs, uh, you know, you'll see a, a sentimental side of us as well, um, a little bit more towards the end that kind of opens up a little bit more into our personal lives and things that, you know, we might have going on or want to achieve in our future. Um, so I think you know, a lot of laughs coming up, a lot of fun things, and then some serious sides to us as well. And Rachel, in the, the the pandemic that we've been dealing with, obviously so much heaviness. Uh, to be able to put a smile on somebody's face, maybe uh, brighten their day a little bit. I mean, I know that's got to be the icing on the cake, right? You know, when COVID hit, we were, I mean, the world was shut down. I was talking to my dad, and he's like, you know, what a weird thing. We filmed this show. We're the only show right now that is going to continue filming. And then we're going to air during a really horrible time. It's going to bring a lot of joy to people. And he's like, I truly believe that we were meant to make a show. And I was like, wow, that's a really good perspective on it because um, what a great way to come back to TV when everyone's been deprived of new stuff and come out with just fun, wholesome show that makes people happy. It's a great feeling. There you go. And again, uh, new episodes, Thursdays, 9 Eastern, 8 local time on E! The Bradshaw Bunch, and uh, we've got Aaron and Rachel on the line this morning. Guys, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to be on the show and looking forward to new episodes. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much for having us, and I hope everyone enjoys tonight's episode and, and enjoys the rest of Season 1. It was a pleasure to be on here with you guys this morning. Yes, thank you. All right, you guys have a great rest of your week. Right, you too. All right, guys, we've got another very special guest here on the podcast and uh, comedy writer, comedy legend, I would like to say, uh, Bruce Valanche. And uh, I, I know he, he, he uh, patting his back over there, I'm sure. Right, Bruce? I, I, 
if I could reach that, I would. And I probably would, I would have another career if I could do that. <laughs> That's right. Now, now, Bruce, the uh, the, the, the pandemic. Uh, what kind of effect has that had on 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 the writing, or or has uh, has it helped your comedy stylings a little bit? Uh, uh, no, it hasn't helped comedy <laughs> the comedy stylings. Um, <laughs> Because uh, you're, you're basically you're creating uh, you're creating stuff that may if you're doing stuff about the pandemic you don't know what the shelf life is on that. Although I have a feeling that this is like this has been so seismic that it's like writing about World War II. You know, I mean, it, it's not going to go away. There will be telling stories about this for a long time. And in fact, I wrote. Uh, I wrote a musical uh, on a on a PPP grant for a theater company in Florida, and uh, hopefully we'll get it up if, uh, in, in the spring. But it's about a guy who was uh, sheltering in his parents' attic, and uh, his his intimate connection with his uh, imaginary friend Dolly Parton. <laughs> But it's full of stuff about, I mean, it, it wouldn't exist were there not a pandemic. But we're, our hope is that by the time it gets uh, performed, there'll be a certain nostalgia factor. <laughs> but, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon. I mean, the whole world has become dismantled. So it's a, it's a, it's a whole, it's a, truly a cataclysmic event. But what it, I, I'll, I'll say this, I mean, humbly, I will say that writers can continue to, I mean, writing is one of the great things you can do without pants. That's right. <laughs> and everybody's doing everything without pants these days. So it's, uh, you, you can write, you can get paid, and you can conduct a semblance of a normal life uh, as long as your Wi-Fi connection holds out. <laughs> so uh, I've been hunkered down in my Hollywood man cave, reading, writing, streaming, Zooming, and falling in love all over again with porn stars long dead. <laughs> that's, then, that's and suspect is like a lot of even in Oklahoma, I think that's happening. You're right. And, and Bruce, for for you, where did where did the comedy originate for you? Was it? Uh, I'll ju I'll just let you expound on that. I looked in the mirror, and I thought, well, that's funny. And I started making faces, and I don't know. I guess it it was something in my in the DNA. It was. Uh, who knows to where it comes from? I know I was, uh, I had very supportive, nurturing parents who recognized that I was happier when I was performing. So they encouraged it. They just had a, a, an innate fear that I couldn't make a living at it. So uh, I, they were always encouraging the writing as what they used to call a fallback. And you have a fallback. And, uh, 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 and they said, you know, you should write for a newspaper. They'll, they'll, they'll never go out of style. I thought, who knew? <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. But so I was lucky in that regard. And my, my mother was, was uh, starstruck and stage struck. And uh, she, you know, it wasn't like Mama Rose. I mean, I wasn't having the career she wanted to have. But she loved the idea that I was in show business, even as a kid. I mean, they didn't push me into it. I really, I liked doing it. And they, and they. They had me, I, I acted as a kid. I was a child actor. I was never a child star, or we'd be having this conversation in rehab. <laughs> I, I was a child actor. and But only because I enjoyed it. They weren't making a living off of it, and uh, they were putting it all away for the, you know, college. And uh, so it was, it, I mean, it was, a, it was a great thing. And my mother's family, my mother's side of the family was very theatrical. Uh, I had, a, I had a, an, an uncle a great uncle who was a Catskills comic. He wasn't a successful Catskills comic, but he was a Catskills comic. And they were all characters. They were each and every one of them a character. And, you know, I, 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 I intend on writing about them someday before it all goes away. But I didn't use them the way David Sedaris has taken his family and made an empire out of it. And I, I think I'm kind of a schmuck for not doing that. But I had other <laughs> things I was doing, so... There you go, and he's and he's brilliant. So now, what is what is your favorite type of writing? Is it is it the the, the shows, the the scripts? Are, where do you get the most enjoyment uh, from from sharing your thoughts on paper? Well, I suppose I get the most it, the most enjoyment you get is the visceral enjoyment is when you write something that gets performed, and uh, for in my life, it has mostly been stuff I've written for other people to perform at, in in their shows as themselves or as characters they've created, 
or I get to see stuff done on television right away as opposed to playwrights or screenwriters who uh, create in a vacuum and uh, and then uh, you know it, uh, watch eventually as the thing happens so it's almost as as good as the the rush you get when you're performing and and people are reacting so I guess it's that kind of writing but um it's all, I mean, there's, a, there's another whole pleasure that you get when you're in what I call the alpha state, when you're writing something, um, if it's fiction, where where the, the, the kind of, the characters sort of take you over and it's, you know, like even a, if even a fat guy like me forgets to eat <laughs> because you're so you're so wound up in uh, in what you're writing that that you kind of shut the world out, and that's a similar thing that happens to performers before they go on, where they have to just uh, focus down. You know, I love all these stories about stars where they say, "Well, we were told not to look them in the eye," and you know, that's basically because. You're working and they're working and their work involves summoning up all the stuff that they have to do to project whatever it is in front of the camera or on stage. And you're interrupting that if you're busy trying to make a connection with them. So save that for after. <laughs> now, do you do you find yourself whenever you're deep in, in, in a writing process? I mean, how long is there? Is it kind of like running where you get to a place where you're just like, I don't think I can stop this pleasurably. Uh, uh, yeah, um, we want to, you know, it's, uh, you're just having such a good time. But that's why we have unions. And they say, time, well, you can keep doing this, but you're going in the golden time, you know, so, which is time and a half, uh, or even worse. I mean, it may, be, it may be double time. Depends. Depends on the union. <laughs> And and how has how has demand for writers changed as a result of well twenty twenty? The demand, well, as I as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of stuff is being developed because it's something that can happen, because you can sit there with no pants and do it, as opposed to uh, acting, getting up on a set and facing somebody without a mask. That's more complicated. The writing is. What it always was, the difference is when you do any kind of group work, which is what happens a lot in television comedy, uh, and in movie comedy too, for that matter, the, you're, everybody gets into a room and rewrites something together. Um, that happens on Zoom. It's not as much fun on Zoom, but again, you don't have to wear pants. That is, that is so right. You make, so you make your own fun. Now, when you're when you're dealing with that, how how does the the, the feeling in a in a writing session change whenever you are remote? I mean, obviously, uh, you don't have the, uh, the the, uh, the the feeling of being in the room. There's, but there's to, a difference. You mm -hmm. don't you don't feel the same energy. I mean, when you're in a in a collaboration with somebody and you're physically there, uh, there 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 are many more. There are many more physical cues you're giving to each other. Plus, you are, you know, you really are working as a kind of an audience at the same time. And, uh, and there's no delay. On Zoom, there's always that little delay, which kills, kills the joke. It's hard a lot of time, you know, to, to, uh, to do stuff exactly right. But, I mean, it's not, so, but it's not so bad in the writing sessions. It's when you perform stuff on Zoom that you don't, it's, everything is very flat. You know, you don't get a, you don't get a, um, any kind of real reaction. So I, I've, you know, I've, I've stopped watching those things, Zoom play readings and stuff. I've done a couple because we had to as part of the deal. But, uh, uh, you know, generally, if you have an audience that's watching you on Zoom, right, and if you don't want to hear sirens going in the background or babies crying or people farting, you ask them to mute their, their, <laughs> their microphone, but then you don't hear the laughs. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, I mean, you're trading off something, you know, a, a fabulous joke getting stepped on by somebody's cat <laughs> suddenly deciding to meow or, uh, you know, you, you play it into a void because uh, you see them laughing, but you can't hear them. And there is a difference. <laughs>
And I, I know I've talked to several stand-up comics that have that have thought in, uh, and a couple that have actually attempted the Facebook Lives, and I, I can't imagine how how painful that must be to deliver the joke and not be able to hear the laughter back, kind of like you were talking about. It's crazy. It's like it's permanent crickets. Yeah, I mean, as I say, you can look at the screen, you can see them. You know, they could be holding their sides, and that's nice. But uh, it's not the same as being in the room with them. So, so you know, but, listen. When you when you work on movies, um, it's uh, it's it's even it's it's similar because uh, it's the crew. You know, the crew are the only ones who were la- who were there to laugh, and uh, um, so it's. Uh, hang on, I'm sorry, I was interrupted by. <laughs> see, this is what it's like. Somebody delivering something, and uh, it's crazy. Anyway. Being yeah. a, being a spokesperson and uh, also being out there, I know it's been uh, for the LBGTQ community, and uh, I know with the virtual pride parade that went on earlier this year and being involved in that. Do you think acceptance is is better now than than when you came in? And I guess that's my biggest question. Came out <laughs> since you came into the business and came out. That's what I was saying. Uh, of course, acceptance is. I mean, we. You know, we we can we're married now. <laughs> I mean, if we were uh, a part of the mainstream of American society, uh, uh, unless of course this you know the the new Supreme Court decides to relook at it. But it's uh, I mean it's settled it's settled law, but also it's, it's settled life. I mean, people are are uh, uh, no longer living on the fringe. They're no longer outlaws, uh, and uh, they're they're part of the world but that doesn't mean that there's total acceptance you know i mean it's the same black people have the same situation they're part of everything legally too but it doesn't mean they're totally accepted by white people so it's the same thing with uh, with gay people it's uh, we have we have what we were we were trying to get legally and our civil rights doesn't mean that everybody every straight person accepts us but what are you going to do i'm also jewish and a lot of people hate that hate us so you know, you grow up in Jewish and you say, uh, a lot of people hate us. A lot of people are going to hurt us. Uh, let, we have to take care of ourselves. And and that's the same thing with gay people. It's a good mantra. To, to, you, you must take care of yourself. And what can I tell you? The other Jewish mantra is, uh, they tried to kill us. They lost. Let's eat. <laughs> that's right. Every Jewish holiday can be described in those three lines. And Bruce, speaking of the holidays, I mean, how much different are the holidays going to look this year? I mean, Black Friday may actually be uh, survivable this year around, right? <laughs> I think they've moved Black Friday up, actually. There. <laughs> well, you know, Amazon may have destroyed Black Friday with uh, Prime, uh, whatever the, the um, Prime Day. Prime Day, right. The 13th and 14th. I'm not giving Jeff Bezos a plug, but I have to say, if they're the 13th and the 14th, if you can if you can get onto their website, that is like, that will be like the Black Friday of the Internet. Although, um, you know, Black Friday on the Internet's been big, too, and, and so big that there's Cyber Monday, which is the Monday after Thanksgiving where, uh, where uh, people return things or... <laughs> People, uh, people uh, order stuff that's on suddenly on sale, or they realize Christmas is coming. Uh, I don't think it will. It, I mean, obviously, it, there will be a physical difference. It's hard to, to tell because I live in L.A. and you know we're much more uh, still on lockdown than a lot of other places. Mm-hmm. You know, people are going to the movies. There's nothing to see. I mean, they went to see Hocus Pocus last weekend. I mean, there's nothing to see, and uh, but people elsewhere are living different lives than people in California are living because uh, because we're taking it seriously. What can I tell you? <laughs> now, now, Bruce, if folks want to keep up with uh, w- with your writing and uh, appearances, whenever that does uh, become available as well, where th- where can folks find uh, all the information about Bruce Valanche? You could go to wegotbruce.com. <laughs> which is uh, named after a movie that was made about me 20 years ago called Get Bruce, which was uh, um, produced by Harvey Weinstein, who never laid a hand on me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, hashtag why not me. <laughs> That's awesome. And we're, I, I keep saying I'm working on the sequel, Had Bruce, with a much larger cast. <laughs> but, but We Got Bruce, is, it's run by uh, a fan uh, in Pensacola, Florida, and... Uh, 
and he, he knows more about what I'm doing than I do. I'll get these emails from him saying, I hear you're doing such and such. And I thought, which is news to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, so he, if, if anybody has a morbid interest, they can, they can go right there and they'll find out. They'll find stuff out right away. Well, that's good stuff. And Bruce, it's, it's truly been a privilege to visit with you. I appreciate oh, you taking you. some time to, to be on. And hopefully we can catch up again as, uh, as things uh, loosen so. up a little bit. So. Enjoy, enjoy. Uh, Alice, Oklahoma, is that really, but not spelled like the girl? <laughs> it's Altus. <laughs> oh, pardon me, Altus. Yeah, I've got to get this these, this prescription corrected. I'm telling you. <laughs> these Walgreens glasses are not doing it for me. No offense, Walgreens. Keep selling me drugs. <laughs> Well, thanks again for tuning us in for this 29th episode of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. If you ever have a comment, question, anything else you'd like to know, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and on Facebook, all at GQ with Cam. If you'd like to help out with the funding for the podcast, feel free to click the support tab and follow the instructions. Also, if you have any special guest ideas, send me an email, Cameron at KWHW.com. We'll see you for episode 30 coming up tomorrow.